Well, welcome to our panel discussion that we've all been waiting for. Does the God of Christianity exist and what difference does it make? Sponsored by the Christian Book Expo, which is a company of the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association and also Christianity Today. I'm Stan Guthrie, Managing Editor, Special Projects for Christianity Today and author of the book, Missions in the Third Millennium, 21 Key Trends for the 21st Century. I'm also your moderator today. <laughs> Some of the authors here on this stage will be available immediately afterwards to sign their book, so please do look for them. It's a great opportunity. As a sponsor of the panels at the 2009 Book Expo, CT is pleased to offer you, first, a one-year subscription to Christianity Today, which is the nation's premier evangelical Christian magazine for only $15. That's a savings of nearly $10 off of our regular $24.95 subscription rate. Second, for those of you who will be going to college or sending a loved one to college, we're offering two free years of our Christian College Guide, which is eight issues in all, nearly a $40 value for free. It has lots of practical advice about choosing, paying for, and adapting to college life, and insights about today's leading Christian colleges. When you came in, you saw a response card on your seat. Just fill it out, and we'll collect it from you in the boxes at the door on your way out at our booth, number 1230, or you can go to our website directly, christianitytoday.com slash CBE. We make it easy for you to get the best Christian news and commentary at an unbeatable rate. Thanks. And now, on to our workshop. A little more than four decades ago, America was told, God is dead. But a funny thing happened on the way to the funeral. The God hypothesis refused to die. And today, strong majorities of Americans continue to believe in God, and there has even been a resurgence of theism in the academy. According to one of our panelists, Dr. William Lane Craig, author of Reasonable Faith, Christian Truth, and Apologetics, Dr. Craig is Re Research Professor of Philosophy at Talbot School of Theology. Yet the atheists have not taken all this good news, from the Christian perspective at least, lying down. Rebranded as the new atheists, in recent years they have gotten off the mat and come out swinging. And with us today is one of their most accompli accomplished pugilists, Christopher Hitchens, who is a contributing editor for the Atlantic Monthly and Vanity Fair. Christopher is author of God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. Also with us is Douglas Wilson, co-author with Christopher of the book, Is Christianity Good for the World? Doug is a pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho, and a senior fellow at the new St. Andrews College. Another of our panelists is Lee Strobel, formerly with the Chicago Tribune, Lee is author of The Case for the Real Jesus, The Case for a Creator, and other bestsellers. Last but certainly not least, Jim Dennison is theologian in residence for the Baptist General Convention of Texas. He is author of the book, Wrestling with God, How Can I Love a God I'm Not Sure I Trust. Please, won't you welcome all of our guests again. Now, panelists and audience will have plenty of time for questions later during our discussion. But in this first part of the program, this is where you get to say anything you want. There's only one limit, and that is you have four minutes. And I, so it comes with an important caveat. But I will give you a, a cue that you have about a minute left. So please do try to stay within the time frame. I'll cue you, and we'll start with Lee Strobel. Go ahead, Lee. Thank you, Stan. Um, there was a time in my life when I would have been an enthusiastic supporter of Mr. Hitchens' positions uh, since I used to be an atheist. Uh, that was until my wife, who was an agnostic, uh, became a follower of Jesus, and I was encouraged to use my legal background and my journalism background to systematically investigate if there was any credibility to the Christian faith. It took me two years of my life to do that. And I just want to hit on a couple of things that I learned along the way. 
first thing I looked at was the scientific evidence pointing toward God. First from cosmology. Scientists now agree that the universe and time itself began in the Big Bang. That leads to the argument whatever begins to exist has a cause. We know the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And as Dr. Craig, who's an expert in this particular matter, has said, we can draw logical inferences from the evidence. And that is that this cause must itself be uncaused, timeless, immaterial, powerful, and personal. Pretty good starting point for a description of God. Then I looked at the physics of the universe, and I found that there are uh, certain aspects of the physics of the universe, things like the force of gravity, the cosmological constant, the uh, strong nuclear force, that are fine-tuned on a razor's edge to allow life to exist in the universe. In fact, they are so finely tuned that uh, to such an incomprehensible degree that I think it makes a naturalistic explanation pretty silly and it points more powerfully toward the existence of a creator. Then I looked at the evidence of biological information, that inside every cell of every living thing is volumes of biological information, that is in the form of DNA, which spells out the precise assembly instructions for the proteins out of which the organism is made. Now it's interesting that nature can produce patterns and even complexity but whenever we see information, whether it's in a software code, whether it's in you know, painting on a cave wall, whether it's in a book, universally we know there's an intelligence behind it. Now look at consciousness. Materialists can't ac uh, um, account for such things as free will and intentionality. But Christians can, because God is an unembodied mind. And it makes sense that we would have finite minds if we're made in God's image. Finally, I looked at the evidence for Jesus, and I personally found extraordinarily compelling evidence that he, first of all, made the claim that he's divine, and then secondly, he backed up that claim by his resurrection from the dead. I used to think that the resurrection was a mere legend, but there are multiple independent early reports of the death of Jesus Christ, his empty tomb, and his post-mortem appearances. In fact, we have a report in the form of a creed of the early church on the resurrection of Jesus, mentioning specific eyewitnesses, including skeptics, that has been dated back by scholars from a wide range of theological belief, including atheists, to as early as 48 months after the crucifixion of Jesus, and therefore the beliefs that make up that report go back even earlier, virtually to the cross itself. So there's not enough time for legend to have developed. I spent two years, I said, investigating this. I finally came to the point where I realized that to maintain my atheism, I would have to believe that nothing produces everything, that non-life produces life, that randomness produces fine-tuning, that chaos produces information, that unconsciousness produces consciousness, and that non-reason produces reason. And frankly, I just had enough, didn't have enough faith to continue to believe that. To me, the most logical and rational thing that I could do was take a step of faith, not against the evidence, but in the same direction the evidence is pointing, which is a logical thing that we do every day in various ways, and put my faith in Jesus Christ. How has that made a difference? It's made all the difference in the world. I mean, many of us could talk personally about the difference that Jesus made in our life. We'll probably talk about the impact of Christianity as a panel on the world. Uh, I will say personally that to me the idea that Christianity poisons everything is simply not true. It's something I can personally testify in that the way in Jesus, that Jesus has influenced my life has been positive, has been good, especially knowing that I have confidence that I will spend eternity with him. Okay, thank you. I'm going to do something that moderators often do, and that's going to ask you to hold your applause till the end, or otherwise we'll all be uh, applauding the whole time because we've got a lot of brain power up here. So please, please just anyway, wait. Anyway, uh, all praise belongs to Allah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Christopher, you're next. Right. Oh, good God, I'm not ready. Um, very well. Uh, f uh, my first duty, actually, it's not a duty at all. It's a, it's a pleasure. Is to say that when I asked my publishers when I began this little book, um, please to arrange that I not just do the New York type book tour, um, but to go to the places where Christians were and ask them if they would be kind enough to debate with me 
um, was one of the happiest decisions I ever made. I, I've been very impressed ever since by the, by the warmth and the generosity and the, I won't say the tolerance because that would be patronizing, but the, 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 um, the very, the, 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 the right spirit in which uh, my challenge was greeted, most particularly and most early by Pastor Wilson, um, with whose um, co-authored work uh, you will find uh, fine bookstores are equipped uh, everywhere, including here today. <laughs> All right. Now, there was, a, there was another bestseller um, just before the First World War. Um, some of you may even have heard of it. Um, it, it was a, a sensational bestseller in the English-speaking world. It was called When It Was Dark, and the author was a man called Guy Thorne. And the, the, the mise-en-scene of the novel is this, that archaeologists digging in the greater Jerusalem area come across a big round boulder, and they roll it away, and there's a tomb behind it in the hill. And on the uh, slab of the tomb, is the um, re really quite well-preserved cadaver of someone who has been badly scourged with a horrible whip, who's had nails driven through his hands and his feet, who has a terrible wound in his side, and who has a crown of thorns pressed down very hard on, on what's left of his scalp. And this is an absolutely certain discovery. Or so it is reported on the wires for the London Times, which first prints it, and then the, the story spreads around the world. And as the story spreads, darkness descends. <coughs> People cease to care for their wives or their children. To coin a phrase from, I think, Lady Bracknell, they start doing it in the street and frightening the horses. Um, they borrow and they don't return the money. Uh, they take money. Um, uh, they help themselves. Uh, there's no, there are no standards left. It's all over. Until it's revealed that this was a cruel hoax and imposture, uh, probably a Jewish one. Um, uh, and the, the normality can be resumed. People are, are okay to behave well because the resurrection has not been disproved. Now, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that it's puerile to think that way, and servile too. That if it could be shown, as I cannot in fact, that the story is entirely, not just partially, but in, entirely legendary, and mythical, I believe I could get quite close to doing that. I do not believe that any one of you would start behaving worse. I don't know you, but I love you as if you were my brothers and my sisters, as I am quite entitled to do without being in communion with you. And I have the feeling you could survive that news and still be decent to your friends and a great river of support and strength to your families and still feel solidarity with other humans you hadn't even met because you know that without that we couldn't have evolved and we couldn't survive as a species. And I submit that as a, as a proper basis for ethical study um, and, and in the belief that the proper study of mankind um, is man. I do think that Jesus was on the mythical verge um, of where history starts and prehistory ends. There will never be anything like conclusive proof but I don't mind because um, the more that the fabrication uh, is uncovered, and many of the stories about him are known to have been untrue, the more one is impressed by people's wish that it be true at the time. Um, and the more one feels that this, all this invention and all this uh, fabrication wouldn't have been worth it if there'd never been any such person. Paradoxically, the more effort that goes into the myth, the more you think, well, maybe there was a King Arthur after all that it isn't just legend, but that this person was the son of God and proves it by having a virgin for a mother and by being resurrected, is, these things are incoherent. Someone could have a virgin for a mother and not be the son of God. Every, every prophet, every holy person ever born, right, right up to and including uh, Kim Jong-il, has had miraculous scenes at the birth, usually involving the unlikelihood that the mother ever had a sexual intercourse. Uh, that's commonplace. Uh, resurrections are repeatedly, uh, uh, Douglas sometimes describes them as resuscitations. resuscitations to distinguish them because these people go on to die again. But nonetheless, 30 other people dying is, is known to have happened um, in, the, in the Greater Jerusalem area at that time, whereas asserted to do so. It might not prove anything on its own. Um, all right, now I've really got to be quick. Does it do any good? In the last week, <coughs> The Pope has gone to Africa and said, AIDS may be bad, but condoms might be worse. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury has said, a uh, man who, I don't know whether he's a shepherd or not, but he may, does a very good impersonation of a sheep, has said that Muslims in Britain should have Sharia law and the church should help them to install it. And the Russian Orthodox Church in, in Moscow has become the official church of Vladimir Putin and his new dictatorship and has started minting icons, actual icons with portraits of Stalin in them to sell not just in Georgia as wonder-working and miraculous objects. And these are just only the three largest Christian denominations in the world, and I'm perfectly well aware that to many of you in this room, 
uh, those people aren't really Christians at all. Um, hands up who doesn't think the Pope is a Christian. <laughs> or that the, uh, the Greek Orthodox Pope is a Christian. Or that the Archbishop of Canterbury is really a spiritual leader. You're not putting up your hands, but you know who you are. And the fact that there's no, and the fact that there's no agreement on who is or what is a Christian or what it is to be one is not my problem. Um, and it's not by any means the least of yours. I've just mentioned some of the others. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Ah, don't even think about it. You can, you can laugh, you can cry. I try both. No clapping. Bill Craig. Okay, I want to begin by thanking Stan for the privilege of taking part in today's panel discussion and to say how pleased I am to be on this panel with these other distinguished colleagues. A case for um, biblical Christianity can only be outlined in four minutes, so let me give you some of the reasons for why I believe in Christian theism. First of all, I think that God is the best explanation for why anything exists rather than nothing. This is the deepest question of metaphysics. And it seems to me an argument for God along these lines is valid and, and cogent. Whatever begins to, or rather, uh, whatever exists has an explanation of its existence, either in the necessity of its own nature or else in an external cause. If the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God. And the universe obviously exists. From that it follows that uh, if the uh, universe has an explanation of its existence, then God exists. And uh, since that first premise requires that, I think this is a good argument for God's existence that one could defend in more detail. Lee has also outlined another argument for God's existence based on the beginning of the universe, that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Philosophical and scientific evidence shows the universe began to exist, from which it follows there is a transcendent cause of the universe beyond space and time, which brought the universe into being from nothing. Lee also mentioned the third argument that I would appeal to, the argument based on the fine-tuning of the universe. The fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life is due to either uh, physical necessity, uh, chance, or design. And I think it's plausible and improbable that it's due to either physical necessity or sheer chance from which it follows that it's due to design. A fourth argument would be a moral argument that would run like this. If God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. And by objective values, I mean values and duties which are obligatory and binding independently of whether anybody believes them or not. I would argue, secondly, that objective moral values and duties do exist, that in moral experience we apprehend a realm of objective moral values and duties from which it follows necessarily and logically that therefore God exists. The ontological argument, I think, is also a sound argument for God. It shows that if the existence of God is even possible, then it follows that God exists. And the idea here is that God, by definition, is a maximally great being. There can be nothing greater than God. And a maximally great being would be a being which is omniscient, omnipotent, and morally perfect in every possible world. Well now, if it's possible that there is a being like that, it follows that there is a possible world in which a maximally great being exists. But if a maximally great being exists in any possible world, it exists in all of them, including the actual world. Therefore, it follows that God exists. So if God's existence is even possible, it follows that God exists. The atheist would have to not merely deny that God exists, but that it's even possible for God to exist. I would also then argue, as Lee did on the basis of Jesus' radical personal claims and his resurrection from the dead, that um, Jesus is the revolu a revelation of uh, the uh, creator God of the universe that is apprehended through the arguments of natural theology, that the best explanation of the facts of the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection is that God raised Jesus from the dead, and that therefore it follows that the God revealed by Jesus of Nazareth exists. And finally, uh, I would say that God can be known uh, immediately through personal experience. Uh, philosophers call beliefs of this kind properly basic beliefs. They're not based upon deeper inferences, rather they're foundational to a person's system of beliefs. These aren't arbitrary, rather they're grounded in experience. 
And that's what makes them properly basic. And I think for the person who knows God, who has a personal relationship with God, the belief that God exists is a properly basic belief grounded in his experience of God. And that therefore it, it is both rational and justified to believe that God exists in a properly basic way. So those would be seven arguments that one could use in defense of a Christian world and life view, all of which I think are sound and, uh, and therefore cogent and provide justification for believing in what C.S. Lewis called mere Christianity. Thank you. Jim? Thank you, Stan, so much. When you walked in today, you thought, well, this would be the highlight of the day. It sounds a bit like a joke. Did you hear the one about four apologists and an atheist that <laughs> gathered at a Christian book expo? <laughs> you know. I am delighted to be part of this conversation and honored for what's going to come ahead. I am prepared my remarks for today as I was staring at a painting of the island of Bougainville in the South Pacific. My father was stationed on this island in World War II. 300 men were placed there. 17 survived. One of the 17 was a painter. He made 17 renditions of Bougainville and gave one to each of the survivors. I have my father's hanging in our study at home. I stare at it each day and I think about my dad's faith. Dad was a Methodist Sunday school teacher until he fought in the Second World War. He never went to church again after that. He struggled and questioned the very existence of a God who is all perfect and all powerful and all loving in a world like this. Dad had his first heart attack when I was two and died of a heart attack when I was a senior in college and never came to terms with the faith issues of his life and I grew up with all those questions. I grew up with all those issues inside of me. They led me eventually to a doctorate in apologetics and to teaching apologetic materials on four different seminary faculties and to our conversation today. I'm honored to talk with you about my father's issues. They are my issues. I think they are your issues as well. We are here today to talk about two questions. The first has to do with the reality of the God of Christianity, and the second with the relevance of such a God. As regards the reality of a God of Christianity, my central assertion today is going to be this. Faith in God is a relationship. All relationships require a commitment which transcends the evidence and becomes self-validating. That is the case in a marriage. When a person examines evidence but then steps beyond the evidence into a self-validating experience. That's the case in choosing a school or a job or a friendship or any relationship. We examine the evidence and we'll do a great deal of that today. You've already heard today about cosmological, teleological, moral, ontological arguments for God's existence. We'll talk together today, I would imagine, as regards evidence for the authority and trustworthiness of Scripture and the divinity of Christ. But I'm going to say at the end of the day that faith in God is ultimately a relational decision. A relationship that must, at the end of the day, be experienced. In that regard, I rather envy Mr. Hitchens his task today. I would think that it must, in some ways, be easier to question the existence of an experience one has not had than it would be to argue for such an experience with a person who is unwilling to do what is necessary to have that experience. At the end of the day, I'm going to be arguing for relationship as the category of faith. As regards the relevance of that relationship, I would make these assertions. First, I would remind us that we're not dealing with religion, per se. Mr. Hitchens has said that religion poisons everything. I would suggest religion has no ontological status. It has no independent reality. There are religions. There is no such thing really as religion. Just as there are leaves, but no such thing really as leaves. To put all religions under one category and castigate religion because of the activities of some religious people seems to me something like condemning medicine because of the practices of some doctors. Again, we're going to talk, I think, about religion in the abstract, but I'm hoping we'll think about relationship. I'm going to assert today that we cannot measure the moral relevance of any religion necessarily by the lifestyle of each of its adherents. There's a causality question. How do we know the degree to which the religion caused the behavior? How do we know the degree to which the behavior is consistent with the moral values of that religion? It's a cause and effect. And then ultimately I'm going to suggest today that God redeems all that he allows. In that relationship, a personal interaction with the God of the universe has enormous relevance for all of us who live in a chaotic world. God joined us in that world. To paraphrase Irenaeus, God became one of us that we might become one with him. 
It's that relationship I'm looking forward to defending today with you. Thank you. Pastor Wilson. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. It's an honor and pleasure to be invited here. I'm very grateful for this opportunity, so my thanks to the organizers of this event. Those of you who have seen the uh, movie Collision or who see it tonight will see that Christopher and I are in danger of becoming friends if we don't watch it. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Here. We'll see what we can do. right. And I would remind Christopher showing up at uh, events like this, that the scripture says that bad companions corrupt good morals, so you need to be careful. <laughs> And thanks to you all for coming to this event to watch Christopher Hitchens thrown into a den of lambs. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'd like to do is, uh, I'd like to address my comments at, at perhaps a different level. I, I'm in obvious sympathy with what my uh, fellow Christians here have said and, and familiar with the arguments and, and appreciate them. But I, I'd like to um, speak uh, at, uh, on a, a different tier. And that, it, when you look up here, you see us sitting behind a table and, and we're all speaking and you're listening to and watching what's coming out of our heads. But if there's another thing you can do, and I would urge you to do this and say, what, what are they all sitting on up there? What's supporting all of them? I, we, I hear what they're saying, and they say and, and, uh, different things, and they um, qualify or agree and nuance and so forth, but there are certain fundamental assumptions that all of us share. We're saying different things, but we're all sitting on a chair, we're all on this stage, and we, and we share those things in common. And this is the level I would like to address uh, here in my, my comments. If what kind of universe does it take to support a debate like this? What would the universe have to be like? How would it have to get here in order for this to be a reasonable debate? Christopher thinks the universe is a certain way, and I want to maintain that the, uni the way that Christopher thinks the universe is would not generate a debate like this. It would not generate this kind of uh, collision. We, uh, to illustrate, uh, if you were to take a, a bottle of uh, of uh, Mountain Dew and a bottle of Dr. Pepper. Do you want to be the Mountain Dew or the Dr. Pepper? I've never touched this stuff. <laughs> okay, well, if you, if you took the two bottles of pop and shook them up and put them on the table and they were both fizzing over, uh, you, it wouldn't occur to you to ask which one was winning the debate. They're not debating. They're just fizzing. They're not debating. It's just matter in motion. They're not debating. It's just a chemical reaction. Well, what does that mean if you're an atheist and you say that all that is, the cosmos, is just matter in motion? It's just, it's just stuff moving around. It's this infinite billiard ball table with, with the balls going in every direction. It's just this complex chemical reaction. Now, we are complex chemical reactions. I think Christian, according to Christopher, I think Christian thoughts because that's what these chemicals always do at this temperature and under these conditions. I don't think them because they're true or false. I think them because this is just the way it is. The problem is that it doesn't just, that doesn't just apply to me. That applies to him also. So he's making this claim about the way the universe is, but he's not making the claim because it's true. He's making this claim because he's fizzing just like I am. I fizz Christianly, he fizzes atheistically, but we're both fizzing. Neither of us are arguing or debating. In order for a true debate to occur, we have to be made in the image of God. In order for a true exchange of views, we have to have something here in us that goes beyond the, uh, the matter in motion, that goes beyond our physical construction. Now, this relates to something else. This, I think this applies to morality, I think it applies to, uh, to rationality, I think it applies to aesthetics, truth, goodness, and beauty. I think this reduction that I'm proposing is something that makes it impossible for an atheist to mount a case against the Christian faith. 
That doesn't mean that there aren't, there, that there is not room for questions. Uh, I'm a pastor and I've brought up kids and I've taught in Christian classrooms. I would want to distinguish between, however, a doubt and a question. Doubts are those sorts of things that can never be answered in principle. 30 seconds. A, a, a doubt cannot be answered. A question can be answered. Why does Paul say this and James say this? Why does one of the synoptic gospels say this and the other synoptic gospel say that? Why, th those are reasonable questions. I want to maintain, however, that Christians don't need to answer anything coming from the atheist quarter because those are simply doubts, universal doubts. They're not questions because atheism can't support the kind of universe that is necessary to generate a question. In order to generate a question, you have to know where you are to begin with. God had to put us here. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, as moderator, I'm going to take the opportunity to do just a bit of fizzing on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and I was at the movie last night, which I found very interesting and informative. And as I got out of there, it just got me to thinking. And I'd like to tell you just a little story, because this question is going to be directed to you, Christopher. Um, before I came on this business trip to uh, lead these panel discussions, I was in a hurry to get my bag at my office and got a call that the car was sitting outside. And so I hurriedly went to grab my bag and I threw myself off balance in that moment and ended up on the floor. Uh, I have a case of moderate cerebral palsy that I, that I was born with and it's part of my life. Um, I got up. I'm hoping that no one saw me. I don't think they did, but it's happened before and it will happen again. In fact, there's no guarantee that I won't fall off this stage at some point. <laughs> so you may want to be ready to catch me. Yeah. Um, I found the intellectual discussion exemplified in the movie and the books. I've, I've read your book. It's, it's very helpful. I love these arguments. I get into this stuff. Um, but I'm wondering, Christopher, it seems to me that your philosophy of anti-theism is a philosophy for the strong. It's a philosophy for the intelligent. It's a philosophy for the well-connected. And my experience of Christianity is that Christianity I do believe it's true. I understand a lot of these arguments that have been put forward here. But Christianity has something to say for people who are not strong, who are not intelligent, for people who fall down. Christianity, Christianity gives people a reason for dignity, human dignity. We're all created in God's image. It gives us a reason for dignity because Jesus took on our suffering and our uh, frailties and our sin. And it also gives us a reason for hope because he conquered death. He conquered the things that hold us down. And I know that as a believer that at some point in the future I will receive a, resurrect, a resurrection body. And these limitations that I've had to deal with for whatever reason God has will one day be taken away from me. And I guess my question for you, Christopher, is, you know, regardless of the truth or falsity of my beliefs, I would like to know what your anti-theism has to offer in the way of dignity or hope for those who are not as intelligent as you, who are not as strong as you, who are not as well connected. What hope can you and your philosophy give to people like me and, frankly, people who are much worse off than I am? Very well, thank you the question, and if I may say so, for the, for the way in which you asked it. Um, but I, before I go to it, I can't resist Doug's lamb challenge, which is part of being... <laughs> you well, may the lamb challenge is, in a way, well, one way one could describe your, your own um, challenge to me. Um, you remember the movie Quo Vadis? Well, you, you know what I'm talking about. The end of the Roman Empire, the persecution of the Christians, the uh, throwing of the believers to the wild beasts in the Colosseum. Family in um, London takes their little boy to this very exciting movie. He's been begging to see it for a long time. 
climactic scene comes, the arena, the Colosseum is there, the, 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 the reporting scenes, the boy starts to cry unconsolably. He just can't bear it. And they, they take him out to the lobby and they ply him with ice cream and you know, try and soothe him. He, he just can't stop weeping. And they say, what's the matter? I can't tell you. No, it's, awful. it's too awful. Finally, they gave him a simmer down and they said, what was so terrible? And he said, there was a poor lion that hadn't got a Christian. Oh. <laughs> Now, you accuse me, uh, sir, of being on the lion's side of this argument. Of being, I, didn't, I had no idea how well-connected and wealthy and strong I, I looked. My, my reply will take, if I may, it'll, I'll have to give, it'll have to take two forms. First, I don't think that it's true, though it's widely claimed to be true, that Christianity is particularly a religion of the weak, uh, the downtrodden, the lost, the, the abject, those who have been perhaps uh, dealt uh, a, a, a bad hand by life in the first place. What does, what does it mean to believe that there is a divinely supervising father who, not just that there is a creator, in other words, not a deist belief that there must be a first cause, but a theist belief that there's someone who knows and watches and cares. What does it mean to believe that? I think it has two very di disagreeable implications. One is that we are subjected all the time to a permanent, unending, round-the-clock, surveillance that begins at least when we're born, some would say before, and doesn't even quit when we die. There's no privacy, there's no freedom, there's nothing you do that isn't watched over. And then you can be convicted of thought crime. You are already guilty because we know you at least were going to think about it. This is an absolute de definition of unfreedom. It's what Orwell means when he says that all totalitarianism is essentially theocratic. Is this for the weak? No, it postulates a hideous strength, to borrow a C.S. Lewis term. A horrible, unchallengeable despotism that could never be voted out or overthrown or transcended. And a parody, a horrible parody of the idea of fatherhood. I have three children. They don't want me to die, but I'm damn sure I'm not going to see them die. They will be at my funeral. That's my job. This father says, I'll never get out of the way. You'll be dead and I'll still be here. And I'll sit in judgment on you when you're dead as well. You'll never hear the end of me. You'll never see the back of me. This is a hideous, again, tyrannical parody. And it's not a weak person speaking. It's not the still, small voice of compassion. It's the utter arrogance of absolute power. All right. I hope I, if I haven't made that plain this time, I won't be able to improve on that as my view as we go. That's what I believe. Now, let's take a case of someone who's been dealt a bad hand. What about Fräulein Freisel in Austria, whose father, unwilling to get out of the way, kept her in a dungeon where she didn't see daylight for 24 years and came down most nights to rape and to sodomize her, often in front of the children who were the victims of the previous attacks and offenses. And it's only purely by accident that uh, Herr Freisel is now in custody. And it's a shame that he's 76 because his life imprisonment isn't going to feel enough like that to him. I want you to just think, take a moment, since we're so interested in the downtrodden and the helpless. Imagine how she must have begged him. Imagine how she must have pleaded. Imagine for how long. Imagine how she must have prayed every day, how she must have beseeched heaven. Imagine for 24 years and no, no answer at all. Nothing. Nothing. Imagine how those children must have felt. Imagine what, what they felt when they saw one of them, one of their number, the dead twin, being borne away from neglect on top of everything else. Now, you say that's all right that she went through that because she'll get a better deal in another life. Are you, I have to ask you if, you, if you can be morally or ethically serious and postulate such a question. No, that had to happen. And heaven did watch it with indifference because it knows that that score will later on be settled. So it was well worth the going through it. She'll have a better time next time. I don't see how you can look anyone, anyone in the face or live with yourself and say anything so hideously, wickedly immoral as that or even imply it. There, that's my answer. Oh, well, I will, say, I will say just for myself, and then I'll throw it open to the panel, that I have never heard a Christian say anything remotely similar to that. That is a caricature. And Excuse a, me? You just said you'll get a better body having suffered with this one. I hate to put it like this, but it's your own phrasing. She's going to get what in exchange for 24 years of dungeonhood, rape, sodomy, and incest that, according to you, heaven watched? Because... 
That was part of Heaven's plan too. She's good. How are you get one one, I have to ask you this. How do you know that? How, what gives you what do you know that I don't that allows you to say that heaven does this? Second, how can you possibly say it's moral? She can she lives in the universe that I believe in, in which she has justice coming. If she's living in your universe, there's no justice ever. That's the issue. In John Lennon's song, imagine there's no heaven, no hell below us, above us, only sky. Above this poor unfortunate woman, in your world, only sky. In your she, world, a heaven that says this is okay. And a heaven that says, hold on, justice is coming. Every tear will be wiped dry, every wrong will be put right, everything will be straightened out. Trust me, it will be reconciled, it will be put right. So we're in a position... You would have told her that. So we're, we're in a position... Well, I'm, a, I'm a pastor and I've had to deal with people who've been through some pretty hard providences. And the, the question that has been raised is the perennial one. People suffer, people, people do horrendous things to each other. But I'm living in a world where I can condemn it and say, hold on, patience, confidence, faith, it will be put right. You're saying it will never be put right, and that cuts the nerve of being able to say there's anything wrong with it now. And, and I'm, I must interject if I could. My question was, what hope and dignity do your philosophy offer uh, to people who are suffering? What you're saying is not an answer to that question. Look, being an atheist is only to say that one doesn't believe there is a supernatural dimension to the cosmos or to human existence. It doesn't commit you to any one moral or political or ethical or ideological view. It just says, let's suppose what seems likeliest, there isn't a supernatural intervening power. Um, it, it does involve, um, one of the reasons I think it may have a very slight moral edge, however, is that it does involve accepting conclusions that may be unwelcome. Okay? I don't particularly want my own death to be succeeded by annihilation my, and my return to atoms. It's not what I wish for myself, but I'm not going to say I don't believe it because I don't like it, because that would be babyish, wouldn't it? Nobody argues like that. There's such a thing as evidence as well. If the evidence is that there is a sky full of divinity over Auschwitz, as Douglas believes, then I think it's legitimate to ask, what is that sky thinking when it's looking down on Auschwitz? May we inquire? That's before I ask, how does Doug know this? My sky disapproves. Yes. Your sky doesn't but care. But the disapproval doesn't seem to have um, your sky, very much weight. Your, your sky over Auschwitz doesn't care. So the question then arises, why do you care? Well, at least it doesn't watch. No, why do you care? No, at least, excuse me, excuse me, your sky watches with folded arms. And, says, and possibly with pleasure. We don't know what it's... How can we know? Who in this room is going to claim to know what God is thinking and feeling? So what is Who your... Has, do you have the nerve to do this? I bet you don't. What does your sky think? Well, the, the, us, your, my, I say there's only sky. Right, so we, are, we have to be brothers one with another. Why? We have to, we have to, we, we have to fight this off. We have to outlearn uh, the precepts of racism. We have to, for our own survival. We have to, for our children's sake. We have quite enough motive without resort to the supernatural to say why we think, why we nominate certain things as wicked and inhuman and know what we mean when we say these things. But your sky looks at Auschwitz and says, I wonder how it's going on today. And that raises at least the possibility that the sky likes what it sees. You can't know that they're not enjoying it. Except God gave us a book. Hey, why don't Herr Kreisel, why did you go downstairs and do it to her again? We'll watch that. Would you watch that? I'm asking you. Well, why, why are you saying it's ethical to postulate that somebody I, I think does? I think you're making a good point here, and Christopher, in the sense that uh, Christians, I'll, I'll just speak for Christians and the limited experience I have with Christians who are suffering. When bad things do happen to them, a very natural response is to question, God, why are you allowing to this to happen. Why is this happening? Why aren't you doing something? You can read the Psalms and see that over and over where God's people wonder what God is doing. So that is a perfectly natural response. However, I don't believe that it is the It shouldn't be natural for adults. They shouldn't say, why is heaven doing this to me? Why do they think heaven even knows they're there? Jim? It's babyish to think like that. This was my father's issue as well. If there is a God, why would he allow 300 men to be abandoned on an island and only 17 survive? It's been an issue and a struggle for me as a pastor for 25 years as well. I want God to intervene when people misuse their freedom to do horrendous things. I absolutely want God to do that. If I were God, I would intervene. If I saw someone misusing their freedom to do absolutely horrendous things. So then we ask, all right, now where do we draw the line? Let's say that we draw the line that God must intervene if someone is about to misuse their freedom to commit murder. 
I don't want anyone to be able to murder my sons. Well, neither do I want anyone to harm my sons. So now we step the line back. Now I want God to intervene whenever anyone is going to misuse their freedom in a way that will hurt my sons physically. Well, I don't want anyone to hurt my sons morally or personally or uh, emotionally, and so I'm going to draw the line there. I don't want anyone to hurt my sons at all, so now I'm going to draw the line there. At what point, once God starts intervening in free use of human will, does God stop intervening? The Bible tells us that God weeps, God grieves at the outrages that he sees happen among his children. I think I can answer your question, Christopher. How does God feel? God is a father. And as a father, God grieves as his children are hurting. He cries as they cry. He hurts as they hurt. If he intervenes by removing freedom, where does he stop? That's the issue that has troubled me all across my pastoral experience. And that's my response to the issue today. And if he can intervene and determine, then in what sense are we free? We are with the properties of an eternal father. That's the, that's the terminus of un, unfreedom by definition. There would be no, when I'm asked if we have free will, I always have the same response. Of course we do, we have no choice. <laughs> you say we've got free will because we've been given it by the boss. Come on. That's hopeless. Morally hopeless, yeah. intellectually incoherent. May I respond to that? Yeah, please. By Thank all you means. very much. Thank you. The question of sovereignty and freedom is one that has troubled Christians, of course, across all the generations it of should, Christian yeah. theology. As we understand it, Christopher, at least how Orthodox Christianity answers the question, God, because He is sovereign and absolute, wants a relationship with us. He knows that relationship of worship must depend upon our choosing worship, or else it's not, a, it's not worship, it's not love, it's not relationship. And so God chooses to give us that freedom and chooses to honor that freedom. It is God's sovereign choice to give me freedom and to honor the freedom that He has given me. How do you that makes Him no less sovereign and at the same time allows me the freedom that He has chosen as my Creator to give to me. You it's know, the same thing parents do You know do the mind of children. God, in other words. It's the same thing parents do with their children. When we give our children limited freedom, we give them autonomy so that they can make the right choices and they can grow into the adulthood we wish for them. But all, this, all the while, what they are choosing is within the context of our sovereignty. That's how sovereignty and freedom work together in such a way that God is sovereign, and yet we are free. So you know the mind of God? I know what God has revealed of His mind. Hmm. I know how God has revealed Himself in Scripture, how God has revealed Himself ultimately in His Son. When He became one of us, that we might become one with Him. I could never propose that I myself, unaided, could ever know the mind of God. Religion is our effort to climb up to God. Christianity is God coming down to us to make Himself known to us so that He would reveal His mind to us. Thank you. I'd like to uh, shift gears slightly. Do you, did you want to have a, a... No, I think I've honestly... You've been very kind. I've said... Okay. okay. Um, I would like to add an addendum to this. It seems to me that there are two questions here that are getting blurred together. One is, is the existence of innocent suffering compatible with Christian theism? Or is Christian theism some way incoherent, internally incoherent? And it seems to me that Denison and Wilson have both suggested ways in which we can think of God Christianly in which uh, innocent suffering could exist and would be consistent with the character of God. They talked about the need to permit human freedom and you admitted that constant intervention would rob human beings of significant moral freedom. And then they talked about justice in the afterlife, uh, desert and punishment that would be consistent with showing that Christian theism is coherent as a worldview even though there is innocent suffering. That's one question. Then the other question is, but how do you know Christian theism is true? And that seems to be the question you slide to is, is when they first explain the coherence of Christian theism, they say, ah, but how do you know that's true? Now that's quite a different question. That would be the kinds of arguments and evidences that Lee talked about and that I talked about. But would you admit that if Christian theism is true, that it is a coherent view given the sorts of innocent suffering that we talked about. If, if you make the relevant assumptions, yes, okay. um, then it's internally fairly consistent, I think. Okay. Uh, if, if, um, if heaven waited until 2,000 years ago to intervene in the affairs of a species that's at least 100, probably nearly a quarter of a million years old, that le let it rot for 2,000 years and then said, time to intervene, but only in very illiterate parts of the Middle East and by human sacrifice, and that'll, that ought to cure it. That'll mean they can be claimed to be saved. If you believe anything like that, then the rest, I guess, more or less does follow. 
Um, to me, it makes absolutely no sense at all. It's, it's, white, it's a white noise proposition. Um, Doug, it's, now you've made me answer. I should say, I have to return Doug's question to me in, the, in a similar form. He says, if I think that the world is only material, why should I care? Well, even if my children are only material, I still do care for them. Oddly enough, I seem to be programmed to do so. And for other people, too. Um, I don't feel any need to justify myself on this point. It is, it is a fact. We would be moral if there were no gods. So you think that the, your okay. care for your we, children we could, is on the could, level of physics? We couldn't, would be. No, I don't. I, you, you call it physics, not me. But if it's the case that... You said you were if it's the case, if it's the, I, Well, I, I, I see hardwired might be good. Uh, By whom? Who hardwired you? Who knows? <laughs> uh, well, but, so but don't, don't do Christianity the offer same, The same as hardwires the, orang, the orangutan in the California Zoo who picked up the baby that fell into the pit and walked it over to its mother who was weeping and bang banging her head against the bars. Um, You're right. A lot of animals have uh, solidarity. They form families, they look out for each other, they have kinship, ties, they, have, they, they laugh, they cry. They don't laugh that much, they, they, they weep that much, but they have emotions. They don't do this by any recourse to a celestial dictatorship. They don't have to grovel to a Kindle song in the sky who won't go away. Uh, they can be moral without that, in other words. My submission is very simple. Don't make a mystery where none exists. We can be moral without the supernatural. You're using you say we can't be moral without the supernatural. You're using that the, makes us slaves. You're using the word moral to simply speak of behavior set A. So there are innate, you know, mothers caring for their young and instinct, herd instinct and that sort of thing. You're, you're describing behavior set A. But we also have innate impulses that make us want to go to war with rival, rival tribes, uh, take people out who annoy us. That's behavior sure. set B. Now. Also in the image of God, presumably. Oh, no, you, you've got to answer this question. Okay. Um, <laughs> behavior set A and behavior set B. Morality is that which decides between those two behavior sets. Now, you can't say that's innate. Because the, it, and the innate nature of human beings is what gives us the problem. Innate human nature gives us altruistic behavior. Innate human um, behavior gives us genocidal behavior. It gives us both. Now you can't appeal to some innate thing that will tell us how that this one's moral and that one's not. No. But there's, no, there's nothing in human behavior that would surprise you if you thought of humans as a primate species who were half a chromosome away from being chimpanzees. With war, uh, rape, uh, various kinds of stupidity, um, cruelty, waste, and so forth. But why do you call one no, of them? You say these primates are made in the image of God. Whichever it is they do. These now, here's my, here's, here's, my, here's my question. Well, here, here are two of them. The one I was going to ask you. If you say to me, my materialism gives me no reason to care about anybody, why does your belief that ultimate justice will be delivered by heaven make you care about slavery or the emancipation of the, of the luckless uh, Fraulein Frazel from her dungeon? It will be taken care of. There is, in the end, no tear that won't be dried. Why would you care? about the suffering of humanity in that case. It's just as immoral a proposition if you examine it. The way I've put it, ladies and gentlemen, and I, I feel you've been very generous in letting me speak, so I, I want to wrap with this and for now, leave you with these questions. Um, name me, if you can, a moral action I couldn't take or a moral statement I couldn't make because I don't believe in the supernatural. I don't believe in God. You have to be able to do that, it seems to me, to, to, to uh, body forth the claim that uh, ethics and morals are, are founded in religion. And then there's a corollary question. Can any of you think of a wicked action undertaken or a wicked thing said by someone because they were a person of faith? I think you've already thought of one. The female genital mutilation community, for example, is more or less exclusively religious. Actually, the whole genital mutilation community is religious. The suicide bombing community, almost entirely faith-based. You know where I'm going with this. But you can't, I dare you, no one yet from the Archbishop of Canterbury on down in any debate, or if, if, if there is any further down from the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, has ever been able to point out to me a moral action I'm forbidden, they stopped from making, or a statement I can't come up with because I don't believe. Yeah, I, you can, and there's a prize, by the way, attached. <laughs> I, I, I've heard you assert this before, and it surprises me because I think it's trivially easy to name uh, actions that on a Christian world and life view are morally obligatory but on your view are not morally obligatory. Is, is that what you're no. asking for? No, it wasn't the question. Okay. I mean, moral, a Christian is morally obliged to what? Tithe. <laughs> to tithe. Yeah, that would be an example. Pastor. <laughs> it's a pastor. Yeah, so I, don't, I don't think it's moral to give money to a church. 
All right, so there is a moral duty that given Christian theism, one can name that you as an atheist could not name in your worldview. No, it, it doesn't meet the conditions at all. I don't think giving money to a, a, an organization that promotes belief in the supernatural is a moral action. Exactly, but we do. On, on, on Christian theism, this is a yes, moral Christianity is a, to, is a tautology in that way. Once you accept the, that a human sacrifice 2,000 years ago solves all problems and leads to salvation, everything else does follow. Well, I, then I, I, I have no doubt about it. See, I don't understand your challenge then. The challenge, I thought, was to name an action which you as an atheist could not regard or could not also affirm as a moral obligation. And as I say, it seems it's trivially easy to think of lots of actions, if Christian theism is true, that are morally obligatory that you as an atheist could not affirm. Because on your worldview, they wouldn't be moral obligations. Tithing, evangelism, worship... Yeah, let's, let's avoid the tautology uh, that lurks here. Someone wrote to me saying, here's something you couldn't do. You couldn't say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm. Well, no, I couldn't. But you all know the reason I can't do that. Because not everyone can. Only one person indeed has ever claimed in that way to be the Son of God and be in a position to forgive anyone and make it make yeah, good on it. So, I mean, I can, I, that, that's sort, an, that yeah. is an emulation I couldn't make even if I... And wanted to, and by the way, I'm not a great believer in and, forgiveness. And besi um, besides, Christopher, giving money to religious organizations is an innate human activity. Let's, let's sure is. Jim, why don't you... No, I think my question still stands. Uh, so does the latter one. Why don't you quickly wrap this up, and then we'll move well, to I'll another Well, I'll try quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. He had two assertions. One was that uh, he can think of a great number of things which religious people do which are immoral and therefore castigate all religion. That's back to the point I tried to make earlier. To castigate all religion because of the activity of a radical Muslim suicide bomber is like castigating all of medicine because of the activities of a particular doctor, or to castigate all science because of eugenics. No. To put them all in the same category and to call them all religion, I would absolutely reject the decision made by a suicide bomber who is himself promoting some kind of radical Islam. That doesn't mean that his decision impinges on the morality of my religious behavior. As regards your first assertion, it seems that what we're looking for is something you and I would both agree are moral, which you therefore would not do and I therefore would do. If you and I both agree that that behavior is moral, then it is incumbent upon you to do that as a moral thing. The question has to do with the definition, not with the motivation, it seems to me. A doctor conducting eugenic experiments without anesthetic on twins will not be able to point to the passage in the Hippocratic Oath that allows him to do it. He won't be able to say he's doing it in the name of medicine. He won't even be a perversion of medicine. A, a suicide bomber acting in the name of his prophet and his God can find authority all throughout the Quran for what he's doing, and always does. It's, it couldn't, you couldn't have come up with a less persuasive analogy. The, the Hippocratic Oath is not a sacred document. Who cares? No, nor is the Quran. Well, or, or do you think that no, it is? The Quran is thought to be sacred by those following it. The Hippocratic Oath so, can be followed or not to, by two physicians. Med the Code of Medical, medical Ethics and, and the, what I describe as the Hippocratic Ethos That's what, <clears> may not be considered sacred in the way that you mean the word, but it's considered to be pretty... Um, it's, it's that's, why, that's why modern it's, doctors... It's, it's more than just a, 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 a lot of bylaws. That's why oh, modern doctors okay. don't oh, do we're abortions. We're going to move on here. I, <coughs> I think we've all stated our positions fairly. I think we know where we stand on that one. And the uh, commandment to circumcise and mutilate the genitals of children is right in the Bible. And now... Uh, <laughs> 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 Christopher... I don't know why I'm picking on you, but I'm going to ask you another question. Because you can. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty much abusing my power here. But, uh, is there any evidence that you would consider to be sufficient in order for you to believe in the God of the Bible? Um, it sounds closed-minded to say no, doesn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, but actually, I, I don't think it's as, as closed-minded as all that. I mean, if I if I thought I saw um, a resurrection, <coughs> say, um, I would first think I was under a delusion. I would first consult the, the likelihood that there was a hallucination affecting me. It's more, as David Hume puts it, it's more likely, if you see the laws of nature being suspended, that you are under a misapprehension than that the laws of nature, excuse me, <coughs> it's possible I've been talking too much, um, <laughs> have actually been suspended. If I heard voices, in my head telling me that, uh, that 
God wanted a word. I would not expect when I shared this news with my friends for them all to cluster around and say, tell me more. When you meet that person on the bus, as we've all done, what do you do? Do you edge away from them or towards them? So, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have to be persuaded um, that for the first, let's say the species is 98,000, I'm sorry, 100,000 years old, as I said before, that for the first 98,000 years of our existence, heaven just watched us die, of largely of our teeth or in childbirth, <coughs> suffering in ignorance, terrified of volcanoes, meteors, horrible wars over territory, food, all of this, millions of people just dying in panic and, and unhappiness, and ignorance and fear, and only 2,000 years ago decides to intervene. I don't see, I, I don't think I could ever be brought to believe anything like that. Okay. Yeah, that's an honest answer. And I couldn't be brought to believe that there's such a thing as vicarious redemption. I, I, I think, which I think is an, an immoral uh, doctrine. I could pay your debt, Douglas, if you got into trouble, I'd happily do it. And some people have even been willing to serve <clears throat> other people's terms in prison. But I can't say I'll take your sins on me. I can't say you can throw your responsibilities onto me. And they'll be washed away. <clears throat> that would be asking you to enter into a very immoral agreement. We, we would you care to <coughs> respond sorry. to that last point? Yeah, more. Well, you know, raising the issue... Of, he's got a lozenge here. With this oh, oh, thank you very much, yes. You all right? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> oh, my God. We'll good. be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> Should we open this up for prayer? Better, better than yeah. saying I'm fine. <laughs> okay, leave. When you say that uh, when you encounter supposed resurrection, you would uh, your inclination would be to say, yeah, this is a delusion, that I, it can't be true. Yeah. That uh, Well, I think if the claim was that uh, Jesus somehow rose from the dead naturalistically, then absolutely. I would agree with you. But that's not the claim. The claim is God raised Jesus from the dead. We have independent reasons that we cited, and which you haven't refuted, that point toward the existence of God. Therefore, if God exists, for God to uh, choose to raise his son is not an extraordinary event, an ordinary event in his uh, economy. Well, then it's not a miracle, is it? Well, you define it as you will. If, in God's economy, if he's, he's capable of doing it, then he's capable of doing it. So it really is an anti supernatural presupposition that rules it out at the outset. It's sort of like, you know, I'm going to rule out the possibility of supernatural. Now give me your evidence for well, God. Then why does he cry over his creatures, as was just said, and weep over their shortcomings and transgressions and, short and hideousness, when it's, it's just as natural to him as breathing to create these imperfect animals uh, who are bound to sin and bound to fail and bound to get angry and bound to be greedy and nasty and selfish? because that's the way they've been made. How moral is it to say you're created sick and then commanded on pain of hor horrible torture to cure yourself? Well, I think what Dr. Craig was saying earlier is true, which is that there is no logical <coughs> contradiction ultimately in, the, in, in saying that suffering exists and um, God exists. That we've, we've heard, we've already covered that ground on how God wanted to happen. As long as you don't mind being a plaything in somebody else's game. I've or made, a loved son by I've a made you. I've made you. You're, you're full of sickness and there's no health in you. You're, you're wicked. You're selfish. You're brutal. You're cruel to one another. Um, you're going to get punished for this. Really, I mean really punished. So you've been made. You've been born ill. Now the order comes. Get cured. Get, re get well. You, that's an order. What is this? This is, is, is worse than any known form of human totalitarianism. The issue is, there's, there's nothing accomplished by whitewashing them or explaining them away. Sometimes non-believers go too far and, and make accusations that are not well grounded. They make the crimes worse than they actually were. But wherever the crimes really uh, did exist, I think we should own it, accept it. And with, with this proviso, we can accept it as a sin, as a crime against God, as something that fundamentally unjust, because we have a standard of justice. Because I'm a Christian, I have a standard that I can fail to meet. Because I'm a Christian, I have a standard that I, that I do fail to meet, that I fall short of. And I acknowledge my sinfulness when I do, and I see the same thing in the Christian world. There's a standard there. What I don't comprehend is how an atheist 
would look at the Crusades or the Inquisition as anything other than another chapter in this gaudy, meaningless show. Right? S uh, stuff happens. You, you, you've got this parade of foolishness that we call human history. Some of it religious. Some of it, you know, if you want, if you're going to burn a heretic at the stake for not crossing his doctrinal T's or dotting his doctrinal I's, you might as well wear a robe and a funny hat and have a good time. You know, <laughs> why, why not? There is no justice ahead of us. So the, I, I would want to turn it around and say, look, all the charges that you can bring against the Christian faith, Christopher and Christopher can bring quite, enough, quite a few, and I, could, I as a pastor could bring quite a few. All those charges, when they really do fall short of God's standard, I want to accept it and say, yes, we are sinners, we need redemption, we need forgiveness and yes and we've got to repent we've got to put this right we've got to do better but then I would turn it around we can say that that was a sin you can't right the, the atheist has nothing to uh, no, no basis for objecting to behavior any kind of behavior um, throughout history in the past or in the future now Christopher has gone back to what he has, would like for his own sons, the sort of instinctive things. But why would you care what happened to the Amalekites? Why would you ha care what happened in Spain during the Inquisition? Why would you care about what's going to happen 500 years from now? That, that doesn't, there's no traction. As Christians, we can look at it and say, look, God, the one who spoke this universe into existence, has told us how he wants us to behave, and I want to love him, and I want to be a faithful servant, and I want to... Um, conform myself to, to that. So I can condemn Christian misbehavior and ultimately Chris, Christopher can't condemn Christian misbehavior. Thank you gentlemen. Very helpful uh, segment of our program. Now is the time for audience members to ask your questions. And we have I believe two volunteers with microphones. Uh, one over here. Is there another over here? Yes. So. Uh, stand up, let the microphone uh, volunteer know that you'd like to ask a question and ask it uh, briefly, courteously, and to any members of the panel here, and uh, we'll try to answer. And we're going to go for about a half hour with audience questions. Thank you. Um, I'm a psychologist in a prison, and I can tell you that there is probably no more religious population than prisoners. Um, Practically all of them are Christians and sociopaths at the same time. Um, <laughs> maybe one of the apologists and also Mr. Hitchens could respond to, um, you, you know, what, how, does, how does Christianity move people forward morally? I, I mean, I understand that, you know, that, that there is a moral basis for it all, but, but I mean, how does it really affect the people that I work with uh, on a daily basis who... Uh, you know, on the one hand, struggle very hard to believe in God, but on the other hand, uh, get out of prison and, and continue to do terrible things. I'd like to say one thing quickly about that, and this will be it for me. Uh, Jesus said, I have not come for the righteous, but for sinners. I have not come for the healthy, but for the sick. So, on a very basic level, Christianity is for sinners, and I'll leave it there. Who else would like to deal with that? I would, uh, I would echo what you, uh, you said. When, when you establish a church and you start preaching the gospel and you're preaching forgiveness and that sort of thing, who's going to come? The, the, people, are going to, the people who are going to come are the people who know that they have a problem. They, they, they know they need help. And oftentimes they, their knowledge of how much help they need is not up to the level of knowing enough how to change it. So I've spent many, many hours with many people in pastoral counseling trying to, trying to fix uh, really deep-rooted problems that you wouldn't find in the average Kiwanis um, group. All right. You find some of them, but not of the, not of the not same... Not that they'd admit. <laughs> not that they admit, or that they'd seek help for. And, and I think there's a higher level of it in the church. We, because what are we saying? We're saying come to Christ and deal with your issues. Yeah. Well, you're going to get people with issues. I sure do. Christopher? Oh, um, I would say cheer up. Um, <laughs> uh, because uh, very soon there will be a much larger Muslim population. In the, in the, oh. as there are, is now in Europe and increasingly in the United States and they'll be given as they are already being given uh, Wahhabi Qurans produced in Saudi Arabia 
um, which preach violence against Christians, Jews, and atheists. So they only get me twice, I think, out of that. And, uh, <laughs> and um, that'll be all done in the name of the faith-based initiative. <laughs> And that'll be swell. And by, then, then that's only talking about the prison system. Wait till you go to the lunatic asylums and see how many uh, atheists you find there. Most of these people think that the serial killing was mandated by God, because after all, they were only killing prostitutes and scarlet women, for example. And it was absolutely, they were, they were mandated by heaven to be doing it. Either that or they think they are God. In, in Jerusalem, the Israeli police have a, a name for it. They have a special ward, in fact. It's called the Jerusalem Syndrome. People who come to Jerusalem because they've been driven mad by religion. And they think that they'll find a solution by going there. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very common delusion. I just wish people wouldn't confuse it with revelation. Okay, next question. Uh, this is for Mr. Hitchens. Uh, first of all, I'll just say thank you for the courage it takes to do this. I know it's, it's a big oh, please. Um, <laughs> We're pretty rough, aren't we? Yeah, it's, it's been... Uh, we've touched on this uh, somewhat, and especially in the moral issue. But my question to Mr. Hitchens would be, um, do you believe in, in a transcendent, universal um, laws, whether they be logic, morality, whatever? Um, and if you do, how do you account for those in a purely naturalistic universe? Well, I don't think moral laws are as common and, um, uh, what should we say, irrefragible as, say, the laws of, of formal logic or mathematics or astronomy, no. But it is, it is the fact that they, they a, a certain common moral code does seem to be innate to the species. Uh, for example, the, if you take the, the so-called golden rule, um, which is differently phrased, but it essentially means don't do to another person what would be repulsive if done to yourself. There's an element of tautology in it, but it, it works as a kind of injunction. Well, it certainly, certainly was uttered by Rabbi Hillel, a Babylonian rabbi, and it seems to be phrased in the Analects of Confucius as well. In other words, it's, it appears to be common to anyone who's thought about the good or how to lead the good life. And that seems to be enough for me. I mean, I think one of the dangers of, if you'll excuse uh, me, for those of you here, here who are Christian who say, I wouldn't know any of this if I wasn't Christian, is it runs the very dangerous risk of saying that, that common knowledge of uh, the, the moral properties of behavior in humanity are, are exclusive only to those who confess one faith. That would, it seem to me, be an immoral position to take on its face. Now, it seems to me that you're running together again two quite distinct issues. One is the issue in what we call moral ontology. That would be, what is the basis in reality for objective morals and duties? The other is moral epistemology, which is how we come to know moral duties and values. And the claim here is not that we need to know uh, or have belief in God in order to discover what objective morals and values there are. Uh, as a Christian, one could be open to any manner of methods of coming to know moral values and duties. The issue is the ontological question. The, the, what is the basis in reality for the existence of objective moral values and duties. And I think a number of people on the panel have suggested, and you yourself seem to admit, that there really isn't a sort of transcendent basis for these moral values and duties, that these are just the spin-offs of socio-biological evolution. And if you were to rerun the film of evolution backwards and then start it anew, a very different sort of creature might have emerged from the evolutionary process with quite a different set of values. And so, therefore, us, for us to claim that our values are objectively true uh, and binding is to be guilty of speciesism a sort of bias in favor of your own species. And, and so no. it, it does seem that there's a lack or an absence of a foundation for moral objectivity on the naturalistic view. But uh, um, you, you set a trap of your own making there. Uh, the, human, the human primate is both a lot more moral and uh, able to apprehend moral issues, moral questions, and, and in behavior a great deal more immoral than any other species. Um, and we bear, as Charles, Charles Darwin says, we bear inevitably the stamp of our lowly origin. It's very clear who our cousins and our uh, close relatives are. We are animals. But if, um, but if morality is just a function of what, whatever it is we happen to be doing, evolutionarily speaking, then that doesn't make any sense to even use the word morality or immorality. It's just what we're doing. No, well, let's, let's say if, if you wanted a working definition of 
the moral or the good, which it would have to include some element of what we call the golden rule. In other words, caring for other people, not just because you want them to care for you, but because there's pleasure in caring for them available for you too. Why does it have to include that? Well, well it happens to be, happens to be, anything else, as you, as you say, would be reductionist, would be functionalist only, which is a rather arid way of addressing questions of nobility, honor, obligation, and the most mysterious of all the words, agape, love. Um, we, can't, we can't prove the existence of love, but you sure can't disprove it either. And you can't imagine a world where the word didn't have a meaning and people looked at you blankly. Um, but none of this requires the supernatural. There's the numinous, and you've mentioned, sir, the transcendent. These are dimensions of our own imagination and our own cortex. Well, if that's Just true, like, that like, they our, are. Like, our, like our susceptibility to music, for instance. But it doesn't require. There's all the difference in the world between the numinous and the transcendent and the supernatural, especially the supervising, um, in, uh, superintending, intervening bossmanship. Of, of a divine, unchangeable force. But if there is no transcendent, then these are just the accidental byproducts of the socio-biological right. uh, evolutionary I insist, process. I insist there is a transcendent and a numinous. You, in, you insist? I've just been making that very distinction. I'm sorry if I No, no I thought you said there was so no. No, I expressed myself poorly. I, I appeal to the, I put myself in the safekeeping okay. of the audience. Did I or did I not just say <laughs> that the struggle is to realize that, there is, that while there is a transcendent, and a numinous available to us through our imaginations. I would give the examples of love, susceptibility to music, landscape, poetry, architecture, and so forth. There is no need for this to become a supernatural, especially not a supernatural that contains a hidden but unalterable supervising, superintending, you, intervening on, okay, let's dictator. Have one, let's have one brief reply to that and then we'll get to another I hope question. the distinction is plain. Uh, What's Jim, a transcendent? Thank you. Yeah, my question would be, upon what basis does the transcendent possibly come to exist, then? If he we said it was a product of our imagination. It's a product, it's a product of our imagination. And so we call it a transcendent of our imaginative faculty. Let me give you a, a case in point. So, uh, Dr. Francis Collins will be known to you. Of course. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure known to everyone here, or should I say, who would I insult if I identified Dr. Collins? He's the uh, very um, uh, distinguished scientist who completed the work of the Human Genome Project. Mm -hmm. Uh, for which we're all enormously in his debt, and he's a confessing and believing Christian. And in his own account of matters, he says he's an outdoors man, and he went on a long hike, I believe it was in the Pacific Northwest. And one morning he came to a frozen waterfall, a waterfall frozen, there were three waterfalls coming down like this. Imagine a sort of fork of three, frozen. And he said at that point, he dropped to his knees and accepted Jesus as his personal savior. Way to go. Now, I think that I perfectly understand what's being said there, though I regard it as questionable in a number of ways. What if there hadn't been three? I'm presuming the three is important. Somehow with Christians it is. Um, what if it had been four? What if it had been two? Uh, would he not have accepted Jesus as his personal savior? What, what is there about frozen water that makes you think one religion is more true than another? It, would it be just as good if he'd said, I suddenly realized there's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger? Would, would, would it be just as good with the with, same waterfall? Would someone quickly deal with it? Well, this is what's, this is, it's still, exactly. I, still, I still know that some people are powerfully affected by landscape, imagery, and music. Here's the problem. You can't, have, you can't use the word transcendent without saying it transcends what? That's right. The, 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 the space-time continuum is all it is. We, it, when it, when our imaginations bump their head on the ceiling. There's no way to get out. There's no transcendent. The imagination is part of the space. Yes. The well, now, who's being reductionist now? I'm just using your I'm applying you're, it to you're your saying, You're saying if I won't buy the whole supernatural, I can't even have love, music, landscape, and poetry. You can't no, have, any, the, you can't have well, them mean you anything. Well, be careful. And you can't explain them. No. Right. Anyway, to me, Dr. Collins' remark is, is touching and affecting. It makes me think, in some ways, more highly of him as a person. But it is a completely meaningless, not to say nonsensical statement. Okay, next question. Not Hi there. Uh, this is for uh, Mr. Hitchens and Mr. Wilson. Uh, one of the, the kind of the subtopic of this has been: Is Christianity been beneficial for the world? And I, I think that, like, look at if you look at the Christian Reformation, right, and the Reform movement, you see in this like the beginnings and kind of the seeds of like the progressive movement and the humanist movements and the and the liberal uh, kind of revolution uh, that's existed since then. So, uh, you know, by saying by turning like you know the kind of uh, Roman sacerdotalism 
to a uh, position of, of individual responsibility for faith, invest the individual with a new role of action in our society. You see uh, that when everything is to the glory of God, you know, kings and, and nobility suddenly are called into question. Uh, you even see something like with the Westminster Confession, like something that looks very similar to the written constitutions that came later for states. You know, Cromwell undermines the king and brings parliamentary power into play. And if you look at the history of the early radical Reformation, you're looking at places like Switzerland, the Netherlands, and England, which kind of form a, you know uh, uh, the the base for these uh, for the early expression of these ideas. And then the most radical of the reformers are sh shipped out of Europe and shipped over to the United States and form this revolutionary uh, experiment in this country. So what my question then is is do you accept this as being true that that the Reformation has is is inextricably tied to the progress in human freedom that we've seen over the last several centuries and if, if if not why not and if so Mr. Hitchens wouldn't that maybe suggest that this particular branch of Christianity the reform tradition is you know is maybe more good than bad and for Mr. Wilson what does it say about the internal consistency and the eternal immutability of this position that you can draw a, a lot that it seems to consume itself because you can draw a line from Calvin to Hume to you know, Mr. Hitchens here, not to give you a big head, comparing yeah. you to David Hume. Um, now that, now that was from... two questions. Let's, let's mm -hmm. get this deal with those quickly. Yeah. There's other people waiting. Thank you. <clears throat> Do you want to go first? Go ahead. Um, well, you're right in guessing, um, as I think you have, that I am, I am a Protestant atheist. <laughs> Um, as I think, um, well, you laugh. Actually, Protestant someone I know was pulled out of his car in Belfast, and you, that moment you don't want late in Belfast, a guy in a ski mask saying, what, what religion are you? And he said, I'm, I'm an atheist. He said, there's a short pause. Are you a Protestant atheist or a Catholic atheist? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that with a gun to your head. Anyway, well, some idiot reads your passport upside down. Um, George Orwell in 1984 postulates, uh, this, is my, this is my Straussian reading, my close reading of the book. The book is about the, the struggle to possess an, an inner book, a secret book that's the property of an inner party. That's what it's about. And, and in doing so, to, bring, to bring, make people know that they're free. To show them the truth and let the truth make them free would perhaps be my phrase. Um, and it's no, there's no doubt at all in my mind from the reading of Orwell and Orwell's attitude towards Milton, uh, Tyndale, of the Cromwellian Revolution, the struggle to translate the Bible, Coverdale, Wycliffe, that he regarded Protestantism as, as the, the liberation of Europe from theocracy. And the, the, the particular thing was the struggle to have the, the, the Bible understand it of the people, as it says in the 39 Articles, available to and in, and in the vernacular, without the intercession, the interposition of a, of a, a priesthood, the inner party. Um, and the stained glass and flummery and ritual of the telly screen and the big brother and all the rest of it. So that's well, one reason why that's such an imperishable book. And uh, Orwell's favorite line is from, is from John Milton. Um, it comes from John Milton. It's, it goes, it's just like this. By the known rules of ancient liberty. Very good. Very good assertive claim. We, never mind. There was a time when there weren't kings, when there weren't priests, when there weren't popes and bishops, when people understood that they were free and untrammeled, and we want to get back to that time. And so it's still a wonderful poetic and literary uh, tradition. It has a, a very honorable uh, part to play in European history, and yes, it is, um, it is Christian in some ways, and it's, it's, it certainly is Protestant. Doug, do you want to yeah, I would briefly? I would just briefly say that I believe that medieval Catholicism was an improvement on the pagan world that went before, and I would say the Reformation was an improvement on the medieval uh, world that went before. <coughs> but as a pastor, I'm fond of telling people there's always a ditch on both sides of the road. <laughs> you know, um, and I, be I do believe that the processes of secularization were oftentimes continued by people who took things, liberty of conscience, let's say, that the reformers came up with and then absolutized it and drove into the right ditch. I do think that we needed to get free of some of the superstitious nonsense that had kept the Christian world, Christendom captive, and I'm very grateful for the work of the reformers and what happened, but we need to be guard our own, police our own borders and be careful not to veer off in the right ditch simply because we used to be in the left ditch. Um, Martin Luther compared the human race to a drunk who falls off the one side of the horse and the next time makes sure to fall off the, the other side to compensate. You know, just, <laughs> but that's not balance. Next, next question, please. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Hitchens, Um 
Do you speak right allow, into the microphone? Do you allow for a power that might be greater than our own, perhaps a species beyond our understanding? Is that part of your possibilities in your writing? I'm, I'm not a biologist or a physicist. I, I, as for there's certainly power greater than ours, um, as you will study, the, as you will find if you study the Big Bang. I think of the extraordinary energies and forces with, compared to which we are we are dust. I don't know of a superior species to the human race, but I do believe, and all the evidence is, that we are still evolving, that our brains are actually improving a bit, are getting larger, are getting more sophisticated. It's, it's, a, it's a millimetrically small process, but th I have the evidence in my book, available at fine bookstores everywhere, <laughs> uh, for, for this being a real proposition. And in fact, one of the most arresting sentences I've ever read came from Sir Martin Ryle. He's, in Britain, he's called the Astronomer Royal. He's the, he's the Queen's own appointment of the most distinguished astronomer. Martin Rees. Excuse me, Rees. Did I say Ryle? Martin yes. Ryle is, the other, is another one. Martin Rees says, it, it will not be us. It will not be us who watches as, as the sun goes out. As our star swells up into a red dwarf and dies, as, as extinction comes, there, will be, there may be creatures on Earth watching, but they won't be human. They'll be post-human. They'll be smarter than us. They won't have um, quite as many of the stamps of our lowly origin as we bear. We hope their prefrontal lobes will be a little bit bigger, the adrenaline gland perhaps a bit smaller, um, the wisdom teeth a little less obviously uh, chimpanzee-like, and so forth. It can be hoped for. It's not just to be hoped for. It can be observed happening. Okay, next. And it's, that's much more awe-inspiring to me than any uh, encounter on uh, the Jericho Road. Next question, please. Hi, um, <clears throat> Mr. Hitchens, one of the foundations of your arguments seem to be that uh, God created us here um, sick already, um, created us sick and kind of watches us, and as you said, maybe even enjoys us um, getting tortured and other things. And I wanted to ask where you get the basis for that argument, and then also, if we can maybe have someone on the panel say what the Bible says about what God originally has created us here as being. I, I'm sorry I didn't get the last few words, but I got the first. Um, I didn't, I, I did not say that it is that I know that uh, the Creator could be laughing at our sufferings and enjoying them. But I can say that you couldn't prove that he didn't. Because if you are postulating that everyone is made in the image of God, and that for some reason is the insistent claim of Christianity, how they know what God looks like by analogy from us has always seemed to me very mysterious. But that we are certainly made originally sinful is part of the Christian dogma. Is it not? So you're born no, in sin. It's no. yes. no. Originally sinful? No. You don't believe in original sin. Adam and Eve, you know? Well, uh, yes, until Adam and Eve, of course, I was forgetting. Um, <laughs> sinful only si sinful since the talking snake episode, yeah. <laughs> um, now you but have. Not able, not able to uh, uh, say, be not able to be born innocent again. Owing, in other words, born in debt, born heavily in debt might be another way of putting it, and asked to pay it off, made to pay it off. That does seem to me to be, like most totalitarianism, not systematic, as we often say of tyranny, but precisely the contrary. Capricious. Capricious, playful, unsystematic, ludic, toying with people. I don't like it. Okay? You can like it if you like. I don't. Jim? Well, I'd like to propose an alternative way of seeing that. What if God is a father? What if as a father he creates children? He knows that his children are going to have freedom because he's chosen them to have that freedom so they might be able to relate to him. He knows that they're going to misuse that freedom. He knows that they're going to experience pain. He knows that they're going to go through great suffering. But he also hopes and knows and believes that they will experience times of great joy and privilege. And he, at the end of the day, wants a relationship with them wants them to have relationship with him and creates them knowing they will have freedom, they will misuse that freedom, but at the end of the day the good will outweigh the evil because they will have an eternal relationship. That's how the Bible pictures God's relationship with us. Yeah. That's the kind of father and child relationship that Jesus uh -huh. taught us to pray. And that I think is a better way to see the evidence as it is before us. Okay, um, does this apply to other primate species as well or only to us? I think does he care about the sufferings of his other uh, creation? And does he think they have to earn their passage this way? Nope. I just wonder, since you know what he wants, I so seldom meet anyone who can actually inform me of God's will. But I don't want to miss the chance. Yeah. Well, while, you, while you've got me, while, we might not meet again anytime soon. Well, well, I'm can delighted you, can you enlighten me on whether, he, whether the sufferings of other primates and I'm delighted are part to share of the Bible plan? with you. 
If, you, if you're wanting to know what God thinks, I'm delighted to share the Bible with you as any of us would be. Of course, again, as I said earlier, Christopher, none of us are claiming that we speak for God. We're claiming that we're telling you what God has himself said. Oh, and that's this regard, the modest bit, I know. Excuse me? It's, it, that's my favorite bit about Christianity, I think. I'm so modest, I'm so humble, but I can introduce you to God's will, and I can tell you what. And what a privilege that is. Yes, absolutely. What a remarkable And privilege. with what humility you offer. <laughs> and we would be glad to share that with you today. I know you would. <laughs> I know you would. Let Quick, me, boys, me. lay hands on him. <laughs> <laughs> next, next question. Uh, for Mr. Hitchens, uh, you, you alluded to um, how the... The human species is 98,000, 100,000 years old around there. I'll, I'll be interested to see where you get those numbers if you can. And you, you said that how it was kind of like for 98,000 years we were kind of running around into volcanoes and didn't know what to do. And then a couple thousand years ago, God sent his son. Mm -hmm. um, the Bible seems to look at it differently in that since, the, since, as we can both agree, I'm sure that Adam was the first man, that, um, it's a joke, yeah. so. um, that since then that God has been pulling us to himself, that he has been redeeming us. He, you know, with, like the Ten Commandments, there was a covenant, and then we would break that covenant, and then there was covenant renewal. He would give us another chance, and then we would, we would break it, and then he would give us another chance. And that's been kind of the cycle. And so he sent his actual son and gave us, that's why when Christ said that I give you grace upon grace, that the law was actually grace for all those years. He was showing us the way to himself. Um, so to pose in a, in a question, um, if, if God has indeed been calling us to himself the entire time and didn't just leave us to ourselves, how, well, I mean, how does that strike you? And for Mr. Strebel, is the, is the Bible true as a rebuttal? <laughs> you asked first uh, where I get the figures about how long Homo sapiens has been on the... Uh, I've, I've asked this to Richard Dawkins and to, and to Dr. Francis Collins. They, they would say the minimum, we can say there's been independent species, the primate Homo sapiens, us, is 100,000 years. Uh, Dawkins thinks it could be as high as a quarter of a million. There isn't enough archaeological evidence. I, 200,000 seems reasonable. I, I, I take the low figure because I think I only need 98,000 years worth of paternal neglect followed by human sacrifice in, a, in an illiterate part of the Middle East as the redemption to show that there's something wrong with the plan uh, or so as some would put it the design and that uh, as, as with everything else you just said it would have to be someone who was very playful, very capricious, very willing to allow long periods of total indifference um, very much like someone who probably is made in our image. In other words, it may not be an accident, uh, just like us, just like we might be. It would be, I, it would be cruel, Christian. indifferent, incompetent, um, um, and with a warped sense of humor. By what standard? I, so I can feel anthropomorphically related to this guy. I, I, I would like uh, someone, uh, one of the Christian gentlemen on the panel, to <laughs> respond to uh, Mr. Hitchens' uh, repeated citing of 98,000 or 200,000 years. What is a Christian response to that argument that God was just sitting on his hands for... Well, I, I think one of the things, uh, we know from Scripture that the atonement um, was a, an event that went retroactively and in the back and in the future. How convenient. That, well, yeah. <laughs> Gee, it may be designed by God. Um, it, it, you know, it, it was something that, because uh, we can see in the New Testament, the references to people uh, from the Old Testament who are... Um, redeemed. So we know that it acted retroactively. And so I think people who um, you're saying are completely lost in that uh, for that period of time, if they indeed were, you know, made in God's image, I don't know, you know, various theories about when and how that happened, um, would have had an opportunity. I'd like to just throw something in briefly about that. And one of the things that struck me in recent years as I've gone on with Christ is that I'm learning more and more what I don't know. And I'm, I'm beginning to learn that there's mysteries that I won't have all the answers to on this side of life. I just won't. And that is probably one of those questions that I just don't know. But like uh, Jim has said, faith is a relationship. And so I'm able uh, to trust that person even though he hasn't provided uh, grasping me with all of the data that I would like to have this side of eternity. Stan, if I could add something very quickly at that point. The Bible is a practical book. We live in a speculative worldview. 
You and I inherited a worldview from Plato and Aristotle where non-contradiction is the test for all truth, and we're fascinated by speculative questions. How long have we been on the planet? How long has Homo sapiens existed as a distinct species? How long ago did God create the world? When will the Lord come back if you believe in the second coming? We're fascinated by such speculative questions, none of which would change our lives in the present tense today. The Bible is a practical book. It's written in Hebraic mindset, which is very interested, intensely interested in practical issues in the here and now. And so when we ask the Bible what happened to the dinosaurs and don't get a good answer, we can be frustrated that the Bible doesn't answer every speculative question we ask. But if you had the answer, that it was a meteor that landed in the Atlantic and created some kind of dust cloud that created an ice age and killed the dinosaurs, what would that do for us on this Saturday? If you ask the Bible practical questions as opposed to speculative questions, now you're asking what it intends to ask. It's like using a cookbook to repair a car or trying to play tennis with a football. That's just not what it's made for. Most of the criticisms over the years that I've been involved in Christian ministry that I've seen come against the faith are speculative questions asked of a practical book, such as how old is the earth or how old is the human race and why did the Lord wait until 2,000 years ago as we understand things. Uh, back earlier, uh, Christopher had said that it would be a wrong position to say, I don't believe something because I don't like it. And yet at this moment in time, that seems to me to be a position that's being taken. I don't like the fact that we would be here for 98,000 years, let's say, and yet the atonement would occur 2,000 years ago, and so I therefore don't believe it, because I don't like it. Oh, excuse me, that, that's not a, 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 in being, being in denial at all. It's what I said was what you would have to believe. And I say I, I don't think under any form of persuasion I could be made to believe that. But why not, not I don't like it because it's not nice. It happens not to be very nice. Uh, but that's not, my, but that's not the ground of my objection. But why else don't you believe it? Except that you don't like it. I think it's um, in the highest degree improbable that that can be squared with the idea of the benevolent uh, father. But what you're doing is you're saying it's improbable because you point to a storyline of 98,000 years and 2,000 years and so forth. And what we're saying is that Christian theology is narratival. The, it's creation, fall, flood, the Messiah, and the eschaton. The, we, there's a last chapter. Yeah. And you, you can't be reading through the Lord of the Rings and be halfway through the to two towers and say, you know, I've had it up here with Gollum and throw the book against the wall. Um, Actually, that's just where I did that. <laughs> I, I might have guessed that you did that. That's just where I thought, well, I, the hell with this. I have a question uh, related to this timeline issue. Um, you mentioned what will eventually happen to the Earth when the sun uh, becomes a red giant and incinerates the planet and there will be a very different sort of uh, uh, creature uh, existing at that time than what we see today. Suppose that humankind continues to exist for another 98,000 years on this planet. In that case, it would mean that Christ came right in the very middle of human history rather than uh, near the very end. Would that um, ameliorate your objection uh, to any degree if Christ came right in the middle? <laughs> well, remember that we're talking about another species by then, according to Sir Martin uh, yeah. Reese. But uh, the middle, I suppose, better late than never. Um, I'm still a bit. Look, uh, but, I'm, okay. I'm a bit worried about this retrospective baptism aspect, you see. I mean, that, that is part of I mean, your, 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 your gentleman's positions are. Uh, you gentlemen's solutions are unfalsifiable. I can't, having, having made this point about the missing a minimum 98,000 years, that's all right. It's been taken care of over the shoulder. Uh, how we know this? That, that, there's really no way you can prove that to me. I mean, I'm, a, I'm a Navy brat. I was brought up in uh, Portsmouth, and there's a famous story about a, a young cadet being examined for his master's certificate. And, uh, I was told, have I got time for this? Well, I was just going to say, uh, we have time for one more question, oh. and we'd have your closing Maybe statements. Maybe I could probably skip the Matalow story. Good. It's, good. it's a good one, though. <laughs> uh, you Maybe can ask me at the bookstore. Just take it on faith. Maybe you'll it. Maybe it'll come back. <laughs> so one more question, and then we'll allow our panelists to sum up. Go ahead. Chris, uh, we deeply admire you for your willingness to stand up here with the other minds on the stage and with an opposition view, and I think that's to be greatly admired. Uh, this question is specifically for you, and uh, I believe you're probably familiar with this verse. In John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And the evangelical view of this is that Christians, those who believe in Jesus Christ died for us, are going to heaven, and those who don't go to hell. What is your opinion of Christians who believe that statement, but don't try to evangelize to others? 
But don't try to evangelize to others. Yes, none, those, those that don't try to share their faith but believe that those who don't share the faith go to hell. Well, my attitude towards someone who says, I have a meek and mild savior for you, and if you don't like it, you can burn forever and be tortured infinitely, is the same whether they keep it to themselves or try and pass it on to someone else. A person who believes that is a, is a wicked and delusional idiot. <laughs> do, you, do you really believe that about all, all yes, the many I do. people? And, in I, and I, I shall simply have to say, as someone who is a, a beneficiary of a birthright of liberty in two free countries, one of my birth and one of my adoption, that I decline to be spoken to in that tone of voice. I will not be told. I have a supernatural offer for you. You can be redeemed if you believe just in me. And if you don't like it, you can be tortured forever. I won't be talked to like that. That is the language of fascism and dictatorship. Let's, and let's, it's, let's and it's, well. it's directly immoral, and it's a very great relief to know that it's completely mythical. That there isn't a rag of truth to the story. I'm, I'm glad That's that well. you have the freedom to say your beliefs, and I'm glad I live in a yeah, society sure where I have Surely the freedom do. to share my beliefs as well. And now if we could... Uh, I'll... discriminate against. <laughs> I asked, and I have a question, but I'm like you, I can't stand very long. And, uh, well, why don't you ask a very brief question, because it's time to sum up. Why did you do it sitting down? Go, give him the microphone. Because I don't have a microphone. Well, if he's hurting, he should be sitting. It seems to me we got way off base here. This gentleman started off with, this thing was about the existence of God. And it, all I've heard is morality and lots of psycho babble and religious babble. And um, my question is simple. And I haven't read your book didn't know anything about you until I saw your picture in the paper. Uh, but with the precision with which the universe does revolve, which is, is very precise, it gets off a little bit, we're, we're done. And I'm not a scientist. The complexity of the human body is so complex. Given five billion years, if we were here, do you really believe that evolution, the Big Bang, and the, the degree with which the universe revolves could just happen. Do you really believe that? I noticed there's a big tendency lately, it's called the fine-tuning argument, to impress me, or to try and impress me by saying, <clears throat> look how nearly nothing happened at all. Look how nearly it was all a complete failure. I've, I've, I've failed completely to see the force of this argument, either scientifically or by analogy. Here's the situation. Um, Edwin Hubble, as you know, discovered that the, the effect of the Big Bang was that the universe was exploding away from itself at a faster rate than had been thought. But it was uh, going very quickly indeed. It's called the red light shift. Um, most people thought that if only for Newtonian reasons, that would go on, but it, the rate of expansion would slow. It just couldn't possibly keep going that fast. Um, Lawrence Krauss and other very distinguished physicists have shown relatively recently the rate of expansion is going up. It's burning away from itself faster than it was before. So very, very soon you won't even be able to see from the red light shift what the evidence of the original Big Bang was. We were lucky to catch it while we could. It's going. And in the meantime, so a lot of where, wherever the something came from, there's a huge amount of nothingness headed our way at, at warp speed. And in the meantime, if you want a smaller example, just look at the night sky where you can now see the Andromeda galaxy almost without a telescope, headed directly on collision course for hours. That's coming. Who knows which will happen first? A lot of nothingness. A lot of nothing. No, a lot of nothing. Well, where, where, look, where's, if all this, you've got all this somethingness, I'm going to have to tell my Navy story now. But wait, how does this, how did, well, it's, well, you know, it's you, directly relevant now. You can tell that in your closing how, statement. How does this refute the fine-tuning argument yeah. since the cosmological constant, which drives the acceleration and the expansion of the universe, has to be fine-tuned to one part out of 10 to the 120th power yeah, yeah, yeah. in order for us to exist? Then, then let's take it even smaller case. I mean, I was doing just the suburban one of the Andromeda galaxy that's headed for us. Take our own just tiny little village, uh, the solar system. Um, of all the other planets in the system, all of them are lifeless, except our own. Either because they're much too much, much too bloody hot or much too bloody cold. And that's true of large tracts of our own a planet as well, which are on a climatic knife edge, as we have good reason to know, and we're studying more and more, and threatens us with 
extinction relatively swiftly. And if we were to become extinct, all we would be doing, well, not all, but one of the things we'd be doing, would be joining the 98.9% of all species ever created on Earth that have already become extinct, as we very nearly did in our very early days in Africa. So, some design, huh? And some tuning. It's basically an extinction racket, a huge lottery in which most people and most things lose and in which we are fated and slated to do so. So, you, if, since you're, um, it seems to me that simply expressing continual thanks and gratitude for this and retrospectively conferring baptism on the people who died before they knew that we were all going to go extinct um, is, is nullity defined. Okay. Thank you all for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't have more time for more. Now it's time for our, our closing statements. We're running a little bit behind, so I'd ask each of you to take three minutes to sum up for us and uh, leave us with something to chew on. Uh, we'll start this time in, in this uh, order. We'll start with Jim and work our way down that way. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Stan, and thank you, each of you, for joining our conversation today. I am especially grateful for Lee. He and I have been friends for years, and I'm so grateful for his work and ministry. And I have watched Dr. Wilson and Dr. Craig with great gratitude and have profited from what they have done. I have enjoyed immensely my reading of Christopher Hitchens prior to his writings on religion and have found him today to be, uh, and have found him today to be exactly what I expected. I expected him to have humor. I expected him to be insightful and bright and brilliant. And it has been an honor to do this with you, Christopher. Thank you. And You're very good. You Thank you. Well. Three points I would make by way of closing that seem to me to be part of the issue that has been discussed for two hours as we have looked at the reality and the relevance of the God of Christianity. First has to do with the uniqueness of the atonement. It continues to bother so many people that Christianity would claim that Jesus is uniquely the way to God and that his death 2,000 years ago is uniquely our hope. My mother suffered from uh, colon cancer a number of years ago. There was one particular chemotherapy that saved her life. We were not frustrated that we didn't have 29 options. We were grateful for the one chemotherapy that was effective in combating the disease that would otherwise have killed her. Jesus is the only person ever to have died on the cross to pay for our sin. The only person ever to take our place. That offer is available to all of the human race. It's not a problem to have only one key as long as that key opens the lock. It's not a problem to have only one road as long as it leads all the way home. The uniqueness of the atonement is that God loves us and has made possible his love for us through Christ. A second point I would want to make returns to the distinction between Christianity and religion. Again and again today for these two hours we have discussed the problems and struggles of world religions and I continue to want to say Christianity is not religion, it is relationship. And to condemn Christianity because of the excesses of other religions is simply patently unfair to the Christian faith. My last point that I would make would be, uh, and I was fascinated to hear this before, that uh, Christopher had said that uh, he did not understand really what it could be that would persuade him against his atheism or away from his atheism. Antony Flew years ago made an argument against Christianity that it was not falsifiable. That in fact no argument could count against Christianity which made it meaningless speech. Uh, Antony Flew has since become a theist, which is a fascinating step that we all hope Christopher will take as well. In the course of the conversation, I would want to make the point out of 1 Corinthians 15, and it returns to Christopher's original opening statement, if someone could in fact prove to us that they had in their possession the corpse of Jesus Christ, Christianity would be false. The Bible says that if Christ be not raised from the dead, we are of all men most to be pitied. I believe atheism is non-falsifiable. Christianity is falsifiable relative to resurrection. It is demonstrated by the reality of the resurrection. My last point would have to do with, again, the meaning and the significance of this personal relationship. Yesterday I was part of a service, a memorial service, for a 98-year-old member of our church who had lived a remarkable and distinguished life. From there my wife and I went to the hospital where we waited for one of my dearest friends in the world to come and tell us that his wife had completed the childbirth process for a baby who was 19 weeks old and would not survive. And when he came to tell us that their child, Charlie, had been born at 217 yesterday and we could go back and we could see him and we could be with them and now we're planning a memorial service in a few days I can tell you that if that father and mother were here today they would tell you that their faith in Jesus Christ is the only hope they have and the ultimate hope they have and the meaning that they find in such a chaotic and fallen world as this and I am so grateful they have that hope and I would want to offer that hope to all who are willing to consider the claims of Christ today Thank you. Lee? 
I have to say I, I share this gentleman's frustration a bit because, um, and I, I, I share it not only in terms of today's discussion, but also in terms of reading books by Christopher, uh, or his book God is Not Great, um, and some other books by some militant atheists recently that, you know, we, we, that we just kind of refuse to deal with uh, the kind of affirmative arguments for the existence of God, refuse to wrestle with those, refuse to respond to those, and instead kind of, you know, it reminds me of a court of law, you know, the trial lawyers will say, you know, if, the, if you've got the law on your side, um, you know, then argue that. If you've got the facts on your side, argue that. Otherwise, argue the opposite. He doesn't have the facts on his side in terms of the evidence that points toward the existence of God. And so we, we, we kind of have focused a lot on various permutations of the pain and suffering issue in various ways, for which there is a, Christ, a, a theistic and a Christian response that, that's been articulated and I think makes sense. So, uh, you know, I would encourage um, uh, some further discussion at some point about these arguments that stand unrefuted. I mean, the fact that they, you know, um, Christopher said a minute ago, he said there's not a rag of truth to Christianity. Well, that's a statement, an opinion. That's not, that's not an argument. That's not evidence that points to something. And, you know, I, I, I would challenge anybody to transcribe his response to the fine-tuning thing and, and, and read it on paper and see if that makes one shred of sense. Um, in terms of answering the ultimate question of the fine-tuning of the universe. You talk about disteleology, and we can get into that. There are answers for that sort of thing. So I, I think my frustration is, uh, as someone who had uh, been an atheist, and being persuaded that the Christian case um, is a better explanation of the universe and, and our, our life, um, uh, to, to hear some, at some point, writing a discussion really wrestling with these classical and I think uh, evolving in terms of getting sharper with the fine tuning argument and cosmology um, uh, increasingly potent arguments for the existence of God. Thank you, Lee. Doug? Uh, I thought of one thing in this last uh, question about the complexity of the human body. Uh, if you want to if you want to uh, be a non-believer uh, you can always spin it that way. My brother-in-law uh, had a uh, professor in medical school who was an atheist and unbeliever and his reason for atheism was he said the liver is so complicated God couldn't make one <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, when you look at the human cell and you look at the complexities of the world around us and the, the, there's much more going on there's there's much more of a prima facie case for a designer than I think the uh, militant atheists want to uh, want to let on. The, the center of my closing remarks I'd like to address uh, speaking for wicked delusional idiots everywhere. <laughs> the uh, problem that I, that I think many Christians have when they hear someone like Christopher say this, that you're, this is theological fascism, it's Orwellianism and that sort of thing. Um, we want to say as Christians, our immediate reflex action is, no, no, we're not. I, 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 we're not trying to be wicked. We, we're motivated by love. If we believe these things, then, then surely we're going to share the good news with others. So we don't, this is not motivated by wickedness. No, we're not wicked. We're not delusional. I used to be delusional. I used to take drugs all the time until Jesus saved me and, you know, that sort of thing. We try to answer it at that level. But I want to encourage you and leave this with you. When Christopher says, wicked, delusional, idiot, says who? In what universe? What universe, what does the universe have to be like in order for wicked delusional idiots to exist? All right? What kind of world is that? It's not a time and chance materialistic universe. In a time, chance, matter and motion universe, there's no such thing as a wicked delusional idiot. There's no such thing. Christopher is telling you these things, but he doesn't have a chair. He's, it's, he's floating up here. I tell you, you come look. <laughs> You know, he, there's no foundation for his moral claims. There's no foundation for what he's saying. And so consequently, it's, it's good polemics. Christopher is a gifted wordsmith. He's a gifted wordsmith. But he's got these moral judgments suspended from an invisible skyhook somewhere. Okay. And I don't know where, what it, where the bolts are. So I don't have to be a particularly good wordsmith to point out to you what you must have noticed. I had to come all the way to Dallas to be told that because I don't believe in the supernatural. The material world doesn't exist. 
Because I don't believe in the supernatural. I haven't got a chair to sit on. I mean, I'm sorry, Douglas. I've, I've heard you do better than this. Now, so Mr. Mr. Dennison. That was an analogy. Mr. Dennison, um, I don't want to seem insensitive about the, the friends of yours who are undergoing this distress, but I want to draw attention to something that you said. You said that their belief in Jesus in their suffering was their only hope. In other words, what you're saying, what you're asking me and others to believe is that if Christianity is false, these people have no hope. Now, do you really mean that? Is it, would it be the case that if Christianity by chance was found to be just one of an, many other man-made faiths? I think a case for which I think can quite strongly be made, that it isn't really that much different from all kinds of other religions that humans have invented for themselves. That we would therefore be condemned to utter despair. There'd be nothing to hope for, nothing to live for, nothing. This is a council of despair. Mm -hmm. It's at one, it's, it's both a too uh, arrogant, it seems to me, too coercive in its implications, and also too abject, uh, too slavish. It seems to me to exhibit both those deformities. I'm not an admirer of C.S. Lewis, but I do think it was very brave of him to say, I'm going here to the delusional point, very brave of him to admit that if Jesus of Nazareth was not the Son of God, the incarnate Son, the Redeemer, if he wasn't that, then his doctrines, his teachings, were the ravings of an evil, mad person. But you cannot say, as people like Thomas Jefferson and the Deists used to say, he wasn't divine, but he was a great moral preacher. No. These doctrines are immoral. They say, leave your family. Don't care about the morrow. Don't care about thrift or investment or your loved ones. Do give up everything. Follow me because the earth is coming. This veil of tears is coming to an end very soon. Um, and vicarious redemption is available. And you'll go to hell if you don't uh, do everything I say. And these, would be, these, would be, these would be delusional, idiotic. Ravings and Lewis was, was brave enough and honest enough for once in his writing career one to make this clear. One minute. Um, one minute. Okay, now I'll, I'll close on Douglas's question to me because it was a good challenge. He says, why, why do I care particularly about things like the Inquisition or the Crusades? I would add the Jihad. And so, why do I find these things more repulsive than others? I'll give you a simple answer. There's enough trouble um, from people who want to run my life, from people who want to tell me what to do, to take my property, to order me about, to tell me what books I can read, who I can sleep with and in what position, what food I can eat or not and on what day. There's a, enough coercion and threat and coercion without some other close con uh, co relative of a chimpanzee, some other primate telling me that he's got the right to tell me these things because he's doing God's will. The initial emancipation, the first emancipation an intelligent human being has to be able to come up with is this. The beginning of freedom and liberty is to say, there isn't a human who can do that to you. There is no human who knows God's will. There's no human being who can appoint himself and say he's got God on his side and that's why he has the right to tell you what to do. This is the first and greatest of our emancipations. All others flow from it. Uh, you'll all feel very much better when you let go belief in the celestial uh, North Korea. Thanks. <laughs> Bill. Well, as I look at my notes from our discussion today, I see on the one hand about ten arguments that have been offered for theism or Christian theism, um, almost none of which have been responded to or refuted. Uh, the argument from contingency for why something exists rather than nothing. The argument from the beginning of the universe. Uh, explained in philosophy and cosmology. The argument from the fine-tuning of the universe uh, was not answered adequately. The mere mortality of human beings doesn't in any way show that the universe was not fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life. The moral argument has not been refuted because it's been simply subject to the confusion between the basis for moral values and how we come to know moral values. And the argument is not that you need to believe in God in order to behave properly. The argument rather is that without a transcendent foundation there is no objective moral value there is, these are just the sociological uh, biological spin-offs of the evolutionary process the ontological argument hasn't been dealt with the argument from bio uh, biological complexity and DNA information Lee's argument from consciousness uh, mind um, Doug Wilson's argument from the impossibility of rationality in a naturalistic universe in which everything is just fizzing rather than uh, the, pro the result of rational thought. And finally, Denison's appeal to self-validating experience. Seems to me all of these provide very powerful reasons for thinking that theism is true, and then the 
Radical personal claims and the resurrection of Jesus, which I think are historically well validated, provide good grounds for believing Christian theism is true. So I have to disagree with Jim Dennison when he says atheism isn't falsifiable. On the contrary, I think it is very plausibly falsified, not simply falsi uh, falsifiable. It is falsified. Now, on the other hand, I hear one argument basically for atheism tonight, and that would be the argument from the problem of suffering. But here the difficulty is that Christopher admitted that given Christian theism, it is an internally coherent worldview. Dennison and Wilson explained that given God's desire to create human beings who have freedom to make significant moral choices and that there will be justice and desserts uh, appropriately given in the afterlife, it makes perfectly good sense to think that there would be a world that would be suffused with natural and moral suffering. And Rich, or, um, not Richard, uh, uh, Christopher doesn't refute the point. He just then says, but I don't see any reason to believe this worldview is true. But we've just given ten reasons to think that it's true. And none of these have been refuted. So I think Christopher needs to come to grips more rigorously with the arguments. I, I, I also heard from Christopher what I expected to hear today. Colorful phraseology rhetoric, uh, congenial uh, personality, but little intellectual no, no engagement idea. with the substance of the argument. And so, no, no so, so, I want to invite Christopher uh, for our debate on April 4th at Biola University that you uh, do some more preparation and come prepared to engage uh, specifically with these arguments uh, because I think that's where the, the real issue is going to lie. We need to uh, ask ourselves, are there good grounds for believing Christian theism is true? Or is this, as others have suggested, simply a dislike of the Christian God that leads one to say, I'm not going to believe in him because I, I wouldn't like it if it's true. That would not be uh, a rational way to behave. It's got to be made more based uh, not simply on personal preference. No such assertion was ever made by me. No, that, that was the accusation made of you, and I, I, I think that uh, it sticks, uh, given the absence of argument um, on your side and your admission that Christian theism isn't a coherent worldview uh, if it has good evidence for it. So uh, I think we need to see more specific engagement with the arguments that have been offered tonight. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That concludes our discussion.